Thank you very much for uh, having me here, and uh, it's great to see everyone here tonight. And you're going to see some common themes. You've heard three different speakers already, so you're going to hear some me repeat some things, but also hope to give you a perspective on some other parts of the things that are going to change in our public space and things that are public uh, elected. Um, we, as the uh, people, to make decisions on in regards to having a good future with this technology as it's incorporated. So I want to talk about these uh, four, five things, starting with the purpose of transportation, and then walk through some of the things that we see, and then hopefully get to a slide of best outcomes that I hope will lead us to some discussion as we move forward. So let's talk about the transportation purpose, that it's a means and not an end. As we're talking about all this great technology and the cool stuff that's coming out, transportation is still about doing something to get us to jobs and recreation, school, to move freight. It's not something we're just designing a system so that we can all play on our system, right? Uh, just like when the phones were first invented, right, was actually to talk. Um, it's interesting <laughs> all the other things that are now part of your phone system. And we're having constraints on our systems right now as we're trying to all get to our jobs and get to our school and get to where we want to recreate and everything that goes in between and move all of our goods and the capacity limits and our environmental impacts that's going and also in the funding that we see um, in our transportation systems. Next one. So recently we had very few choices as individuals as we moved around, right? We just either had some activity so that we walked or biked, we had a personal vehicle, we took public transit, or we had a personal ride. Okay. Very straightforward about what we were doing. Next slide. And on the freight, we also had a few choices. We had truck, rail, ship. That's, that was about it, moving stuff around. Now one of the things, and I could talk very much about freight, but I want to say something that you're going to hear a common theme from me. So all these three of these freight choices, they can be driverless. We have pilot programs of ships out there. Nobody's in charge. Right? The positive train control model now will allow our freight rails to you know, not have an engineer, assuming they can uh, negotiate with their union reps. And then the trucks themselves are going to be autonomous. So as we're thinking about all this driverless, just putting a point into what the public also has to think about um, is what will happen to all these employees that are drivers? Okay. Next. So we've been having this disruption in transportation. And you've heard it from all the speakers here. And you've heard the Uber Lyft. Let me tell you a little driver fact, okay, 75% of the cost is the driver, okay, in that model, all right? We've had the autonomous vehicles, all right, so there's pilot programs of that all over the country, you've seen lots of those. We have connected vehicles, I didn't even put drones up there. <laughs> what will they replace? That's what we're going to talk about. Are they going to replace our personal vehicles? We've heard some discussion about this. Car to go, all right, that was something that you saw people make choices. I have family members and friends who only had one car because they lived in the downtown. They could use a second car to go to get around. I've had two people that have actually had to buy a second car from their family because car to go is no longer in the market. Uh, we'll, we'll replace transit rides. Paul Jablonski, the CEO of the MTS Transit District in San Diego, just said that one of the reasons his ridership was down in 2016 was because of Uber and Lyft. Is that really what's happening? Is that what's going to happen in the future? <laughs> Still to be determined. All right. So behind these modes, especially the autonomous cars, there's three things. There's the user interface. So that's like the data and stuff that's all going on in the background. There's that fancy technology, all right, that it's going to like the bells and whistles about one car it looks different than the other car and how we're going to apply all those. And then there's the asset itself. Uh, this is an Uber car over here uh, in Pittsburgh, uh, out there without a driver. Uh, you can make a choice for there. With companies of the size of Google buying the data of Waze and putting that all together as in that in user interface, the data, um, as Ray was talking about, is really an important underlying piece of what's going on here. So let's look at one type of technology here that's going on. Um, this is Metropia Data is a company, right? and it's being used in Houston. And what they're doing is they think that they're going to help influence the, the choices that drivers are going to make. 
Now there was that app that came out, uh, I can't remember what it was called, and you could see how long it would take you to get on Uber or take a bus or a bicycle. Well, Metropia is taking that one piece further. What they're doing is it's a reward system, right? So that you'll make a choice maybe to go at a different time. Now, my parents moved to San Diego about three years ago from the Midwest, right? They're both in their 80s, and yet, it would not surprise me for them to tell me on Saturday morning at 8.30 in the morning, they're going to Home Depot, along with the rest of us going to Home Depot, because we've been at work all week. We have to go to Home Depot to pick our one. Mom, Dad, couldn't you go any other time? I mean, seriously, you don't have anything else to do it. Uh, instead of going at the time and not looking whether there's a ball game or what other event is going on on Friars Road. Right? What if they were, my parents were pretty technology, um, pretty savvy. Um, they would at least use Google Map to figure out how to go or they have a GPS system. Well, what if they were connected with a program that when they went in there to say, hey, I'm going to Home Depot, it says, you know, at 11.30, I could give you 50 points or a Starbucks card uh, for $5. <laughs> well, could we get my 85-year-old parents to go at a time when it's not when the rest of us can go there? Um, those are the things that Metropia is trying to do in Houston to try to influence our decisions to help us with some of these capacity things. So that's some data that's going on there. Next slide, please. Also, the integration between our traffic management systems, right, and this data. All right, we already use enough data so that we know whether the uh, ramp metering system should go on. Right, we know oh, there's too many cars in the interstate. We'll slow them down. Well, what if, in these predictive models, where we're going to be influencing people's choices, we can put that piece of data into our traffic management system, so it knows that. 60,000 people now have called and reserved an Uber or a Lyft to go home after a ball game, and they have that information because that data system is available to them. They're going, whoa, we better do something else. Okay, this data interface, the security behind it, but the data interface that will help us get people to maybe get an extra Starbucks card instead of going home at that time and stop at the ball game and have another burger before they hit the streets. Um, and our data and that our traffic management systems are getting that kind of information. Next slide, please. And then let me talk about the role of government in all of this. I've listed four specific things that I think government is still going to be doing as we move into the future here. There's the infrastructure. Someone still has to build streets and bridges and rail and ports and sidewalks and bicycle paths. Right? That's still a role of government. And we need to be thinking about like, the funding of how that's going to happen. They are a taxing element. And what they do and how they set up those taxes will actually influence how we're going to see success on our um, uh, autonomous vehicle world. Um, if you think about um, a, a zero occupancy vehicle. All right, the guy, the car that's autonomous that does not have a passenger. Okay. Taxes on that better be very, very high. Because otherwise, people are just going to use them like what we see in Cairo, Manila. These third world countries where the cost of driver isn't 75% of the ride. It's like this little tiny part of the ride. The vehicle is the expensive part. That's a model of what a zero occupancy car, we're not paying for the driver, actually looks like. And they are terrible, because everybody's going to get their cars out there, because there's drivers everywhere providing that service. For us, it'll be an autonomous vehicle providing that service. We don't want our streets to look like that. So one of the roles of government is going to be, how are we going to encourage, or discourage, encourage the correct behavior of having high occupancy vehicles for autonomy and not zero occupancy vehicles going around the street while you finish your doctor appointment. Insurance, all right, we've heard insurance. It looks like they're working on this. I just want to tell you about insurance. Okay, if transportation is just a means to an end, insurance is a means to a means to an end. All right, it's just something that's going to happen in the background. They're going to go figure that all out. It's complicated. You know, is it the vehicle owner, the software owner, the driver, not driver? Um, who, is the, who is responsible when, if things do go wrong? But they're just going to figure that out. It's not the important part. And then you'll see my fourth bullet up there is parking. And that is one of the things, right now, every project we do is a discussion about parking. And that's because we all know that we have to have parking. But it's such a waste. It's a waste to know that every car that each of us own and drive takes three to five spaces for a day. 
right? We've got the one at the home, or the one in front of our home, because your garage is full of stuff, so it's not really in your home, okay? And then there's the one where you get to work, and then there's the one at the grocery store, and then the one at the gym, right? And then you come back home. Three to five spaces. That's a lot of money. Considering each space anymore takes us about $10,000 just to create a parking space. And the government's role in deciding what's the future of that, of what we're going to do when right now, we talk about inefficient vehicles, right? We don't drive them. We don't use them for transportation 95% of the time. If I told you you didn't get to live in your house 95% of the time, you weren't ever going to get to sleep in your bedroom 95% of the time, would you still buy that house? Would you still want to own your own house? That's why timeshare came into place. Nobody wanted to have a place at the resort all the time, or 95% not having it. You get a timeshare, so you use it for the one week. Okay. We've got to figure out what that looks like. Um, because it's impacting these parking things are impacting our companies, um, the jobs that we have, and the, and the wages we get made because they have to have overhead to provide those spaces. It provides an, obviously a housing cost because we all have to have a place to park our own car and retail. And our, and our electeds and us as a community trying to decide this parking thing as we evolve into the uh, capabilities of having autonomous vehicles um, is going to be a big decision for us uh, to discuss. I just want to talk a little bit about the smart cities futures because there was uh, the infrastructure behind all of this. Now the smart cities program, I think most, many of you may have heard, was a US DOT sponsored grant the, for $50 million for cities to compete for to say, okay, well, how, what are we going to do to be smarter as a city? And 75 uh, cities did compete for it, and there was a winner, and it was in Columbus, Ohio. But I want you to see the things that they have made that important was um, the city that could have enhanced connections to transit, those first last mile services, things that were uh, implementable and innovative, the idea that you were going to, again, be a better user of transportation. Remember, the means to an end. You're getting to jobs better. You're getting to things better. You're getting to recreate better. That's the things that these smart cities needed the technology behind it in order to be attractive to um, this uh, $50 million grant. And that's one of the things Columbus could really demonstrate. Next slide, please. So how about those public transit impacts? Um, and my paid job, I got an opportunity to go around the country at the beginning of 2016 and meet with, I don't know, half a dozen, dozen different transit CEOs. So what about this disruptive things? What do you think? Mr. and Mrs. Smart CEO, General Manager, Executive Director, what do you think is going to happen? I had some that said, seriously, I've been waiting 30 years and told that there's going to be autonomous vehicles. It's just not going to happen. OK, that's one way to look at it. Uh, but I had other CEOs, uh, especially Keith Parker and Marta. So Marta is in Atlanta. He's out there saying, he said, Dana, he said, I don't know that I'll need mechanics or drivers in my transit employees anymore. He says, I think a transit agency of the future needs to be that interface so that when you fly into Atlanta and you land at the airport, you've come in and you've given your itinerary, this is what I want to do. And the transit agency comes back with you and says, great, get on this shuttle to go here, and then this person's going to meet you there, maybe a, an Uber driver's going to get you there, and then you're going to be at your hotel, and from there you're going to have your whole transit system, you pay for it right there, even if you're renting a car, you've paid for your rental car, you've paid for your parking space, if we still have parking spaces, you've paid for that bike share um, for that last mile in one of the places. They could even pay for your uh, Braves ticket um, if that was part of your itinerary. Making it easy for people to use a lot of modes and be connected. That's what his vision of what a transit um, agency would be doing in the future. Well, that's really interesting. Um, I think that it's going to be uh, pretty... Uh, uh, complicated for them to get there from where they are now, especially with the workforce that they have now and where they're going to go. I do think that um, subways, um, commuter rail systems, they're going to be part of this, right? We've already invested all that money in putting those rails in the ground. They still are going down. Some of them are spoken wheels. Some of them are, you know, uh, a linear system of rail that goes around an area. But then these autonomous vehicles are going to be like pods meeting you at places, and you're going to say, you know, you guys have all said, oh, we're going to this place, and then eight of you are going to get in this one pod because you're going to, I don't know, to this meeting, and from the train station. 
um, instead of waiting for Jim to pick you up um, and bring you here. Um, or, you know, maybe they're, you know, you'll be going to some place that you're getting connected and you know which of those vehicles um, that you're going to get on. Um, so, uh, so I think that there's going to be a use for those parts of transit. But to try to be building um, a better bus system right now, I know I got a little excellent buses, and you know my company actually designs a lot of bus rapid transit systems. So it's not like I want this to go away. It's just what I keep telling our people: don't get hooked to this. What we're going to design for the next 10 years? Because I don't know where a traditional bus go run systems and pick people up is going to is going to fit in the future um, with the autonomous vehicles that we're going to be able to have from a transit public agency. Vouchers to get on other kinds of things? Okay, that would work. Um, that will help um, move people around because that's one of the responsibilities that we have public transit. Um, but uh, running the buses all over, I'm not sure that's it efficient. Even the all electric buses we're seeing. Okay, next slide. Autonomous vehicles, best <laughs> outcome. So here I'll just put it out there. First of all, I think that the best outcomes in the autonomous vehicle world is that I'd like to see a cost of car is fully recognized back to the parking spaces, back to the environmental costs, um, back to everything else that we have to put into having our own vehicle. Right? Then an autonomous vehicle, as we move forward, make sure those systems are completely sharing those costs um, of what we're doing. I think that we have to have many winning platforms, meaning I don't want just one company, Google, to be behind every car. Okay, I want there to be some competition so that we can um, not have a monopoly, so we can have some innovation continuing to go, as compared to one just platform they're going to be working on. And I want those to be connected. I think that high occupancy vehicles going point to point um, that are autonomous, okay, that's, a, that's where we want to be. Not these ZOBs, man, we want the HOBs going. Um, we want to make sure that we're using our government levers and carrots um, to make sure that that's happening. Um, I want the cars owned by someone else that's not me or you or all those people that have to put one in their car the garage and take up all the space. Uh, Hertz, Avis, Ford, General Motors, whoever that's going to be. But right now, there's an entire industry about rental cars. All right, so we just invested in this huge contract facility down at the airport. Uh, there's rental cars out there. It's that type of model. So that we all don't have to have our own $9,000 a year, $25 a day, supporting a vehicle that we only use 5% of the time. Okay. And then, that, and again, that they are a clean energy uh, option. I think these are some of the best outcomes that we can see um, so that uh, we can move forward with the technology that's coming. So I hope that sparks some, uh, some ideas and some conversation. And thank you very much.